victim who fought off Reynard Sanaga and helped bring him to justice joins us now. He remains anonymous and, of course, we won't be naming him. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. A very difficult thing for you to talk about. Um, you sort of came to, in terms of consciousness, mid-assault. Yeah. And you fought back against this man. You didn't know what he had done to you, but you fought back so hard that, in fact, you ended up being arrested. But by doing what you did, brought to an end a litany of hideous crimes that he had committed. What are your memories of that hideous night? Um, so I was out with four friends, uh, myself and three others, four friends were out for a night out in Patrick in a nightclub, and Earlier hours so into the night, I um, lost my three friends. So I went outside to see if I could contact them. It's 10 minutes passed while I was outside. Mrs. Snyder came up to me and asked me how I was, who I was while I was outside. And as a student, fellow student, I thought very, like, he was warming to me. He was very, just looking after me. Like, are you checking on someone outside is all right? Um, we started talking for 10, 15 minutes. Once that happened, he offered me inside to his flat to keep warm while I wait, wait to contact my friends. Um, then, seeing no problems with it, I followed him inside and went with him to his flat. Still chit chatting, uh, normal chit chat about subjects we did at school and college and university. So, you just thought this was a yeah. friendly person? Yeah. Perfectly normal bloke, you. just helping you out. Yeah, it's for students helping each other out in Manchester. It's a big city, he's helping each other out. Then, he gave you a drink. Then when I went to the side, just carrying on talking, this is where he offered me a drink, two drinks. I went to the toilet because I'd been out for a few hours, had a few drinks, so I needed a wee. Come back to the, his living room, he had two shots, and he took a, two, a red one and a C3 one. I took two shots, the first one was perfectly fine, and the second one was where it started, it was, it was happened, really. And that was really pretty much all you could remember. Yeah, for but then you. And you yeah. wake up in the morning and you know something weird's happened, but you don't really know what it is. Yeah. So basically from that point on until six o'clock in the morning, something like that, I was don't recollect you already, it's still to this day. Well, that's when I woke up and found him. He's still on top of it at this point. And at that point, an altercation starts yeah. between the two of you and it gets very physical. You know you're in a bad place, but you don't really know what has happened. And you get into a fight with this guy and you, you do stand your ground very, you know, aggressively and quite rightly, as it turned out, obviously. Mm. But then the police come for you. They think that you're the person who's committed a crime by beating this guy up. Yeah. How did you feel when they did that? At first, when he, when I first, I thought I'll be arrested the first because the state he was in when I left his flat apartment, I thought this is the going to do their due diligence to just check if I'm, I'm not in the perpetrator, but as I got, Later into the day, it felt like more I was the perpetrator. I was the one who committed the crime. You know, I'm who reported the crime. You were arrested for, for GBH. Yeah. What is remarkable is that as you fled that flat, you picked up what you thought was your phone. Yeah. In fact, you had picked up his phone. The police then, with you under arrest and him complaining that you're an intruder and that you've assaulted him, then go through that phone and on that phone, they find videos of not just your assault, but the assault of numerous other men. That exonerates you, and you're allowed to go free, thank goodness, and that's what ends up convicting him. I mean, that was a remarkable turn of events, wasn't it? Yeah. So I had one phone, and the police, he had another phone on him, so within the two evidence, his phone that he had at the hospital was the one that had my evidence on, and the, the phone that I ended up picking up was the one that had the other half of the crimes on. When did you realise that he had actually raped you? When I got outside of the apartment and it started, after my mind started, my mind started clicking together and thinking, this was wrong, this, this doesn't happen normally. Um, clicked together, that's when I phoned the police about 10 minutes after I left the apartment. One of the reasons that the police believe, you know, he wasn't caught earlier is a sense of shame. Uh, came over many of his victims. They were just too embarrassed to go to the police and, and report the crime. 
Yeah, so the safety belt at first, when I, when I was about to pass out at prison, I thought, like, it's my fault that I'm going to pass out in his apartment. So I thought, like, I took it too far this night. I've drank, mixed my drinks too much. That's put me in this situation. I put myself in the situation, not he's put us in this situation. When you discovered that he was one of the, well, the worst serial rapists this country has ever seen, what did that make you feel? Um, it's the same to say, I've just tried to get on with it. I've, I'm happy that I've stopped him and he can't do it to anyone else. I've just tried to get on with my life and not think much about what he's done to me and just let my, don't let him ruin my life. You, had a, you went to court, you saw him in the court. That must have been an uncomfortable experience. And yet, I think you found it satisfying to know he was going to prison for a very, very long time. And you were going back to your life and freedom and able to get on with your life. Yeah, so that's one of the big points for me. I mean, I, I got a bit of payback by beating him up and also he's going to rest his life in strange ways while I'm going to be stuck living my, outside of the open world, living my life and right, well, he's never going to see the light of day again. The fact that you fought back as well gives you sort of some sense of um, power against him, doesn't it? I know that that was important to yeah. you, that even though you didn't know what he'd done and even though you then got arrested, that's yeah. important to you. Yeah, so I, that's how I've kind of got on with it and how I've blocked out. Like, I got a bit of payback from beating up and stopping him and kind of blocking out the bit where I don't know what happened. Have you, have, you, that... have you got long-term damage from this, do you think? Or have you um, been able to...? I wouldn't know for sure until the future, but as I've just tried to get on with my life and not let it affect me. And... You feel OK now yeah. about life? Yeah. Because it's a very traumatic, awful thing to have happened to you. Yeah, yeah. And many other people, of course. Well, and the trouble is, of course, that police think that he may have assaulted up to 195 men, mm. but they haven't been able to trace all of them. And some of those men may, to this point, mm. still not know that they were assaulted. And they're in, police are encouraging people to still come forward. So, well, I would say it's just, like, I've had the help of my friends and family and the health clinic in my area to to make sure that I was all right. And I say, anyone who thinks there's a problem, might happen to them, it's best to step forward and to deal with it, because there's no point. This is what Snyder wanted us to, is to, is to kill us from the inside. Mm. But we need to let it go out and say it's not a bad thing. It's not yes. our fault, it's his fault.